good afternoon good afternoon everyone uh, we welcome you warmly to the monthly clinical meeting of sri lanka medical association today the meeting will be conducted in collaboration with the sri lanka college of internal medicine the, we would be focusing on maternal medicine and we have lined up three interesting talks all related to pregnancy care the First topic is liver disease in pregnancy. The second topic, hypertension in pregnancy. And the third topic, hyperglycemia in pregnancy. So the first speaker is Dr. Priyankara Jayavardhana, consultant physician in internal medicine. He has a vast experience in uh, managing pregnant patients at Castle Street Hospital for a long time. Over to you, Dr. Priyankara. Thank you. Actually, for, good afternoon. Thank you, Achala, for kind invitation and introduction. I'm going to talk on liver disease in pregnancy. Uh, the liver disease is never welcome by anybody. Because if you get a heart problem, you can get a stenting done or maybe a bypass surgery. And if you get a kidney problem, you can dialyze and get the kidney transplant. Especially in our country, we don't have liver transplant. So if you get advanced liver failure, we, can't, we don't have much choice. On the... Uh, uh, other hand, it's very fearful in the pregnancy because there is a pregnant mother and unborn baby. But if the, you manage the patient properly, they are young and healthy, so they should return to uh, normal health with no sequelae. The problem in pregnancy is that it's difficult to challenge or recognize the uh, situation on clinical grounds alone, as most of the early symptoms of the liver disease are very similar to the normal uh, symptoms in the pregnancy. When you manage a pregnant uh, woman, you have to have an idea about the common uh, anatomical, physiological, and uh, uh, biochemical changes happen during the pregnancy related to the medical condition. When it comes to the liver disease, the, uh, the situations like esophageal varices, pyodonemi, palm erythema, or generalized edema could be normal findings in the pregnancy rather than a liver problem. When it comes to the biochemistry, the liver enzymes like SGPT, SGOT, no change during the pregnancy because of the hemodilution, liver function like SGPT, SGOT could go down. Therefore, the slightest elevation in the liver enzymes, SGPT or SGOT, you have to take very seriously. And the alkaline phosphatase level goes up during the pregnancy, which you have to remember because of the because placenta is producing the alkaline phosphatase. The albumin level could go down because of the hemodilution. The prothrombin time INR will not change. That in, uh, uh, and we have to remember that during the pregnancy, there's a massive synthesis of coagulation factors and fibrinogen, and fibrinogen level will be high in the pregnancy. The platelet count usually no change. In fact, it could be little low in pregnancy. When it, I, in my topic, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, four main areas. The, the most important area is the management of liver disease unique to the pregnancy. That means there are certain conditions, medical conditions happen only in the pregnancy. And these uh, medical conditions, the obstetrician alone can't manage, and the, we, the medical people, should help them. And the situation like hyperemesis gravidarum, intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy, HELP syndrome, or preeclamptic liver disease, and acute fatty liver disease of the pregnancy, these four conditions are unique to the pregnancy. And there are specific liver disease, specific situations, or, uh, there are specific uh, medical problems. Usually they are mild, and if those sit, uh, medical problems comes in the pregnancy, uh, it, uh, the outcome may not be very good. Then I'm going to talk on briefly on viral hepatitis in pregnancy, and finally, uh, a, a woman with chronic liver disease, if she get pregnant, then what would with the scenario and how do you manage the patient? So the liver diseases unique to the pregnancy are, the first one is hyperemesis, as I mentioned. Second one is intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy. And thirdly, HELP syndrome and preeclamptic liver disease. And fourthly, acute fatty liver disease of the pregnancy. Those four conditions are unique to the pregnancy and uh, uh, we should not forget those things as we do, uh, 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 we don't belong to the uh, obstetric team, so we had to have an idea uh, 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 when somebody comes with, uh, with uh, cl similar cl clinical presentation. The hyperemesis gravidarum, we are fa familiar with the situation. It's uh, basically intractable nausea and vomiting in the first trimester, usually mild, but in severe cases, they can have a fluid, electrolyte, and nutritional disturbances. 
In hyperemesis, the liver enzymes are elevated, but uh, uh, very, uh, uh, we, they get very slight elevation of the liver enzymes. And there's no specific treatment, just manage them symptomatically and correct the fluid, electrolyte, and nutritional balance. The second condition, intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy. It's, it's the commonest among the medical conditions unique to the, uh, the pregnancy. Uh, 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 it's get, incidence is around 2%. Characteristically, if a pregnant woman comes with uh, pruritis, elevated liver enzymes and the elevated serum bile acids, you have to consider the possibility of intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy. Usually it happened in the second and third trimester. Usually it won't happen. Uh, you won't get that presentation in the first trimester. It can cause adverse outcome to the mother and the fetus. Pathogenesis of intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy is not clear. People think it could be related to the high estrogen level uh, you get, which you get in the pregnancy. And uh, one third of cases you can get a family history. That means there should be some kind of genetic uh, preponderance. And genetic defect, people think there's a genetic defect in the bile transport, affecting the bile at acid metabolism and catabolism. It affects the clearance of uh, bile acids. Therefore, accumulation of the bile acid occur in maternal circulation, especially in the maternal liver, cause damage in the mater mother's uh, maternal liver. This bile acid can cross the placenta and become concentrated in the fetus, uh, uh, causing morbidity and mortality to the fetus. The clinical features, as I mentioned, <coughs> it's mainly in the second and third trimester. The pruritis is characteristic. It's characteristically uh, worse at night, affecting especially the palm and soul. And uh, uh, they, may, they explain to you that you, they have a rash. They don't have a rash, but there is a severe itching in the palm and soul, mainly in the night. So no rash, mainly in the night, affecting the palm and soul, then you have to sit, uh, suspect the situation. They can have non-specific symptoms like malaise, anorexia, insomnia, and my, if you, when you check the liver enzymes, it will be a little high. And the most important thing is you, have, you need to check the bi serum bile acid level. It will be high in intrahepatic cholesterol of the pregnancy. You, we have to check the fasting bile acid level because bile acid level be anyway high after a meal. Uh, uh, when you confirm the diagnosis of intrahepatic cholesterol of the pregnancy, it's a diagnosis by excluding the other uh, medical conditions. Uh, it can cr create complications to the mother and the fetus, including fetal death. Management of intrahepatic cholesterol of the pregnancy is basically you treat the symptoms and uh, lo look the fetal surveillance. The pruritis is the most dis uh, distressing symptoms. We can use our antipruritic agents like chlorpheniramine, promethazine, or uh, cholestyramine. And uh, uh, urodeoxycholic acid, especially the high doses, uh, re relieve the, the symptoms of uh, pruritis. Most of the time, we have to use combination of medication to relieve the symptoms. And uh, dexamethasone may be helpful as it represses the fetoplacental estrogen production. But when you start uh, dexamethasone, uh, we have to be careful with hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Some people in refractory case will use uh, rifampicin. And if the clotin is affected, uh, we may have to use vitamin K. But intrahepatic cholesterol of the pregnancy, the delivery is the treatment choice of choice at that correct time. After the delivery, we need to discuss with the patient regarding the uh, uh, next pregnancy, because 90% of the chance, if they get intrahepatic cholesterol of the pregnancy in one, preg uh, one pregnancy, there's a 90% of chance that it could recur in the future pregnancies. As it, it could be related to the high estrogen level, when we prescribe the estrogen uh, uh, containing oral contraceptives, we need to, either we have to avoid uh, uh, similar uh, uh, medication, or we need to monitor the liver functions. Third condition unique to the uh, pregnancy is the HELP syndrome or preeclamptic liver disease. HELP is uh, characterized by hemolysis with elevated liver enzyme and low platelets. Because of the hemolysis, you get low hemoglobin and high uh, LDH level. And HELP syndrome usually goes hand in hand with preeclamptic liver disease. Preeclampsia, as we know, 
is associated, it's a combination of elevated blood pressure, urine albumin is positive with generalized edema. And uh, this HELP syndrome and preeclampsia, the risk factors are diabetes, hypertension in pregnancy, multiparally, and elderly pregnancy. Elderly pregnancy is, is common now. Pathogenesis in HELP syndrome, again, not very clear. People believe it is a problem with the, due to endothelial cell uh, dysfunction, causing endothelial injury, uh, leading to inflammation of the blood vessels, and uh, causing microangiopathic platelet activation, consumption, thrombosis, hemolysis, and uh, fibron, the fibrin deposition, etc. Diagnosis <coughs> is important because uh, uh, it is uh, uh, could be a dangerous condition. So initial symptoms could be very mild, like malaise, nausea, vomiting. So these symptoms could be normal to the pregnancy. So you need to differentiate, and you, uh, 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 the uh, uh, the medical condition, and do the relevant investigations like liver enzymes, full blood count, maybe blood picture and uh, uh, look for the uh, uh, hemoglobin level and the platelet count, and um, uh, need to monitor the, the condition because uh, it could gra uh, gradually worsen until delivery. Sometimes people get, <coughs> I mean, pre the, during the pregnancy, they can end up with liver capsule hematomas, and maybe liver rupture, so we need to monitor them, especially with the full blood count and the hemoglobin level, and we have to, uh, uh, before concluding the diagnosis, we have to entertain other similar medical conditions like hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, etc. The management of uh, HELP syndrome and preeclamptic liver disease is basically supportive and targeting the delivery at the correct time. The overall management is not the treating the liver enzymes. You need to treat the HELP syndrome and preeclampsia, and you have to take everything together. And uh, if the patient is pr uh, having a possibility of seizures, need to start uh, mag sulfate, and you need to correct, control the blood pressure with uh, antihypertensive treatment according to the guidelines. And if, you pay, if there's a possibility of delivering before 32 weeks, we, we need to start DEXA to get the lung maturity. And after 32 weeks, you monitor the patient and uh, uh, try to uh, uh, plan the delivery at the correct time. If there's any involvement of the liver, you may have to call the, uh, the surgical team. The final, uh, uh, the final uh, condition unique to the pregnancy, final medical condition unique to the pregnancy is the acute liver disease in the pregnancy. It's uh, uh, acute fatty liver in the pregnancy. It's not uh, very common though. Uh, uh, what happened is the microvesicular fatty infiltration of liver leading to liver failure if people think it's due to a uh, defect in the uh, fatty acid metabolism. Previously, uh, uh, in intrahepatic colitis of the pregnancy, it was due to bile acid metabolism. Here, it's due to a defect in fatty acid metabolism. So it's a pathophysiology is mostly unknown again. Again, it's believed that it is due to a problem in the fetal placental unit. Uh, 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 defect in fetal fetal mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation due to defects in uh, two main enzymes causing accumulation of fatty acid metabolites produced by the fetus and placenta act as a toxic products to a mother who is genetically predisposed to acute fatty liver disease in the pregnancy. Again, the risk factors are the primary gravida and male fetus and multiple gestation. Um, when in fact, acute fatty liver of the pregnancy is commonly associated with preeclampsia with elevated blood pressure. The diagnosis of acute fatty liver in pregnancy, there are criteria like, you know, symptoms like vomiting, abdominal pain, polydipsia, and features of uh, liver failure like encephalopathy, high bilirubin level, hypoglycemia, ascites, high liver enzymes, high ammonia, etc., and coagulopathy, and features of liver kidney failure with uh, elevated blood urea, elevated creatinine level, and uh, gold standard of uh, uh, diagnosis is the liver biopsy, which we don't do commonly. The management of acute fatty liver uh, in the pregnancy, it's a, it is a dangerous condition. So it has, the decision has to be uh, uh, taken by the multidisciplinary team. That means the obstetrician, physician, liver specialist, 
intensivist, uh, anesthetist, and the neonatologist, though they should be a relevant uh, group. So it should be a, a team decision. And uh, we have to start with our routine uh, blood investigation, like full blood count, LFT, et cetera. And if there's any uh, complications need to correct, maybe the coagulopathy, maybe hypoglycemia, you may have to uh, consider broad spectrum antibiotics and may have to consider the, our uh, liver failure management, maybe lactulose, uh, uh, endocytocystine, et cetera. In difficult cases, people have to cons uh, consider plasmapheresis, dialysis, even ventilation. And sometimes you may have to call the liver transplant team, uh, you know, if the, the patient is deteriorating. But the important thing is to plan the delivery at the correct time. Uh, it has to be de decided by the multidisciplinary team. The differentiation between the HELP syndrome and the acute fatty liver disease of the pregnancy is not easy. In HELP syndrome, it's mainly based, uh, get, people get hypertension, protein, urea, edema, et cetera. In acute fatty liver of the disease, uh, liver, if acute fatty liver disease of the pregnancy, people get uh, uh, elevated liver enzymes and features of liver failure like hypoglycemia, hyperuricemia, DIC, et cetera. So, it's, ladies and gentlemen, the, in pregnancy, these four conditions we can't forget, like uh, a pregnant woman coming with vomiting in the first trimester, the possibility of hyperemesis. Somebody coming, the pregnant lady coming with itching in the second or third trimester, uh, the possibility of intrahepatic cholesterol of the pregnancy, and the uh, pregnant lady coming with uh, low plated count, elevated liver enzymes, and low HB. Blood pressure is high, urine albumin positive, maybe a bit of edema, then the possibility of HELP syndrome and preeclamptic liver disease. And a pregnant lady coming with uh, uh, features of liver failure, acute fatty liver, which is in the pregnancy. So sometimes you be, the medics might get a referral from uh, obstetrician saying that I have got a patient, the hemoglobin is low, liver enzymes are a bit high, and the platelet is low. Can it be uh, help or can it be, would it be dengue? The management of two conditions are completely different. Uh, in dengue, you need to postpone the delivery and in HELP syndrome, you terminate the pregnancy at the correct time. So you need to get go through the history and you have to evaluate, the, do the counts, do a blood picture, and uh, may, you may have to do the LDH level, you may have to do the scan, and uh, need to uh, differentiate two conditions carefully as the management is totally different. Uh, the second uh, area in my lecture is the liver diseases exacerbated by pregnancy. There are certain uh, medical conditions, usually they are mild. But if these things happen during the pregnancy, the outcome may not be very good. For example, hepatitis E, herpes simplex hepatitis, Bachari syndrome, malignancy, if those uh, situations comes during the pregnancy, the outcome may not be very good. Even the dengue, if it happened in the pregnancy, the, the prognosis uh, is not uh, very good, so you have to manage it uh, very carefully. Hepatitis E virus, usually mild, but if a pregnant woman get hepatitis E infection, hepatitis E hepatitis, especially in the third trimester, they could end up with fulminant hepatitis with uh, uh, encephalopathy and liver failure. So we have to be aware and we need to treatment. There's no vaccines available for hepatitis E and we, the management is symptomatic. Herpes simplex virus, mostly the type two, and uh, if the pregnant woman but get uh, herpes simplex virus in the uh, third trimester, they can end up with uh, fulminant hepatitis with coagulopathy, encephalopathy, and liver failure. So you have to, we need, we have to suspect clinically. We can diagnose by serology uh, doing the herpes simplex virus antibodies. And in severe cases, we have to uh, consider IV, acyclo, et cetera. But Chari syndrome, it is, again, uh, 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 we know it's the spontaneous thrombosis of the major hepatic veins returning from the splanting flow to the heart. It could be, uh, a pregnant lady could get this uh, situation late pregnancy, even and the, after the postpartum period. We all know the pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state, but uh, and if there's a pregnant woman who is prone to uh, uh, thrombosis, like a, a, a lady with a background history of antipospolipic syndrome, they could end up with this kind of medical problem. So you need to die, suspect those things, diagnose, and may need treatment with systemic anticoagulation. 
The third area in my lecture is the uh, viral hepatitis in pregnancy, uh, the hepatotrophic viruses. We are familiar with hepatitis A, B, C, and the uh, other viruses like cytomegalovirus, EB virus, etc. And among them, hepatitis A and B are more common. They can get acute hepatitis in the, preg uh, the pregnancy, which could lead to chronic hepatitis in hepatitis B and C, hepatitis B and C. Uh, in severe cases, we can consider antiviral therapy, and in relevant cases, we need to discuss those situations in advance with the woman before they get in the pregnant, in pregnant. Hepatitis A, usually uh, it's mild, and it's RNA virus. Uh, 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 if you, uh, if they get it, hepatitis A, especially in the third trimester, the outcome may not be very good. So if there's a, if there's a pregnant mother term and the risk of exposure to the hepatitis A, we can consider hepatitis A vaccine. If there's a mother or neonate ex who is exposed to the hepatitis A, after the exposure, we can consider immunoglobulins. Hepatitis B, Again, it's a DNA virus, transmission, parenteral, sexual, and vertical. Vertical means from mother to baby. Uh, the incubation period is 6 to 12 weeks, so it, the, they can get the same, uh, illness during the pregnancy if they're exposed to hepatitis B. Uh, if there's a document exposure, if there's a pregnant mother exposed to hepatitis B surface antigen positive uh, person, then we can consider giving immunoglobulins in pregnancy. And uh, if the mother is positive for hepatitis B surface antigen, at the time of the delivery, there is a high chance of uh, the, the fetus or newborn getting the infection from the mother, or from the direct contact of blood. So if we don't give the proper immune prophylaxis to the newborn, the newborn will end up with hepatitis B infection. Uh, there's a high chance, at least people say it, nearly 75% of chance of getting hepatitis B surface, hepatitis B, if we don't give the uh, immunoprophylaxis to the newborn. So if there's a mother, uh, if there's a, um, a lady with hepatitis B positive, uh, so we need to counsel uh, uh, the pregnancies not indicated for a hepatitis B virus infected individual. And uh, People who have even liver, uh, severe liver disease, so advanced liver disease, again, the pregnancy is not contraindicated, but we need to discuss about the possible scenario and the possible outcome. But if somebody is on antiviral therapy for hepatitis B the virus, then they have to postpone the pregnancy. And uh, we, uh, uh, hepatitis B, we need to evaluate, and we do the hepatitis B surface antigen as a, uh, it's a universal screen, all the women when, who get pregnant, we do the hepatitis B surface antigen. If it is positive, then we have to go according to, uh, by doing E antigen, E antibody, and maybe uh, uh, PCR for, to detect the viral load, etc. In hepatitis B, no specific therapy uh, in acute hepatitis, but in severe cases, people consider giving uh, uh, antivirals considering the possibility of viral er eradication. And if the mother is positive for hepatitis B surface antigen, as I mentioned, if we don't give the proper immunoprophylaxis to the, the newborn, the newborn uh, will get the infection. So, so just after the delivery, we have to give the immunoglobulin and vaccine to the the newborn baby, and vaccine should, should be follow, uh, uh, repeated again, maybe one month time, four months time, or six months time, according to the local guideline. And later, maybe in a year's time, the uh, infant, uh, we have to check for the possible, whether the, uh, the infant has got the hepatitis B surface, uh, uh, hepatitis B infection. If the newborn is given uh, Im uh, immunoprophylaxis, uh, feeding is not contraindicated uh, from the mother. Hepatitis C, again, it's a RNA virus. The transmission is among the IV drug abuse, IV drug users, and contaminated blood products. Uh, vertical transmission is possible. Hepatitis C is not very common in Sri Lanka. Hepatitis C is an infection which can lead to chronic liver disease, as you know. Uh, hepatitis C, just because they are pregnant, if the uh, woman got hepatitis C, the complications are not. Uh, uh, common, uh, it can go to the, ba uh, the baby. If so, there's a lady uh, 
with hepatitis C virus positive, we don't discourage the pregnancy. It's not contraindicated, but we need to discuss the, the old aspects. If she, uh, during, uh, what could happen and what we, sh what we should do during the pregnancy. And uh, 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 like hepatitis B, we don't do routine testing for universal te screening for hepatitis C, but we can do hepatitis C virus antibody, PCR, etc. Uh, in hepatitis C, there's no uh, immunoglobulin, no vaccines, but if the mother is not having any breast source, she can uh, breastfeed the baby. The final area in my lecture is the uh, pregnancy in a patient with chronic liver disease. Uh, a woman with chronic liver disease, mostly cirrhotic ones, or hepatic discomposition uh, ones, they do not get pregnant because they have ovulator failure and amenorrhea. And chronic liver disease, basically the, uh, we concentrate on cirrhosis with or without portal hypertension or autoimmune disease or situations like Wilson's disease and hepatic masses. Uh, uh, pregnancy, we know, in during the pregnancy, the as accumulation of uh, blood volume increase at least by one third. So a uh, woman with cirrhosis or cirrhosis or portal hypertension, the, uh, during the pregnancy, with the increased blood volume, there's a chance that the esophageal varices or splenic varices could rupture. And especially during the second part of the delivery where the placental circulation coming back to the, going back to the maternal circulation. And uh, in a uh, uh, woman with a uh, uh, liver problem, the, uh, the bleeding is worsened by the thrombocytopenia, coagulopathy, secondary to the hepatic dysfunction. So it is a good practice to do endoscopy before getting pregnant and maybe a repeat in the endoscopy at the second trimester. If there's any esophageal varices, then we can ban, we can arrange the banding. Uh, though the vesopressin, telepressin, and octreoptide uh, uh, contraindicated during the pregnancy, if there's a severe bleeding, to, uh, you have to use those things to save the mother's life. Uh, in situations like autoimmune hepati uh, hepatitis and primary biliary cirrhosis, if the patient is already on immunosuppressin, need to uh, continue those things. The, uh, these autoimmune conditions usually suppress during the pregnancy, but after the delivery, uh, they uh, uh, you have to expect a fair up of the uh, condition. If somebody is diagnosed with Wilson's disease and if she's on chelation therapy, need to continue those things. And we are familiar with uh, the uh, hemangiomas in the liver in young people or focal nodular hyperplasia young, in young uh, women. If they get pregnant, they could end up with hemorrhage during the pregnancy. You have to be aware of that. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's very common nowadays. It's the prevalence the, in reproductive age, in young women, it's the, the prevalence is around 10 to 15 percent, especially in the urban uh, areas. And it is the commonest cause of the elevated liver enzyme among young women. And uh, 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 when with polycystic ovarian disease is associated and going hand in hand with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And, uh, but fortunately, it does not specifically affect the liver just because they get pregnant, but it usually tied to other metabolic syndromes like diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. In pregnancy, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease may be a predictor of GDM. After delivery, then we need to ask them to control the BMI, etc. So ladies and gentlemen, during these 25 minutes, I tried to, uh, though I was a little fast, to go through the management of liver disease situations, liver, uh, liver, uh, management of liver disease unique to the pregnancy. And then we briefly discussed the specific uh, medical problems. Usually they are mild. If it happened in the pregnancy, outcome may not be very good. Then we briefly discussed about the viral hepatitis in pregnancy and a uh, woman with chronic liver disease, if they get pregnant, uh, what could do, what other things we should do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jayavadana, for covering most of the important topics related to liver disease in pregnancy. It's a vast area, and I think you covered most areas adequately. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, now, uh, the session is open for uh, questions. Uh, those who are joining online can kindly type your uh, questions in the chat box. We can refer it to the speaker.
In the absence of any questions, can I ask you, uh, in relation in relation to hepatitis B infection in a pregnant mother, when the newborn child is delivered, you said you can give immunoglobulin. So even after giving immunoglobulin, how sure are we? How do we make sure that the baby has adequate immunity? Well, we give the immunoglobulins and the vaccine. Then we are not going to test at that point. Then we, uh, so we have give, done our duty. We have given the immunoglobulin, we have given the vaccine. Depending on the country's guideline, you have to repeat the vaccine again one month, three months, six months, you know. And maybe after one year, you can check the, inf the uh, newborn to see whether they see, has got uh, hepatitis B uh, infection. Some countries, they don't recommend that also, but you know, you can check it in one year's time, not before that. Yeah, but it's B surface antigen and do as a routine, and then you go accordingly. Thank you very much. Um, there is one more question. What is benign recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy? What is benign recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy? Yeah. It's the same. The intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy. Uh, uh, you can, it can be severe or it can be a benign condition, depending on the clinical spectrum. Uh, uh, usually, so some people, they respond very well to the management. Some people, the uh, bile acid level will not go very high. When you start uh, uh, urodeoxycholic acid, the bile acid level comes down. Sometimes when they, when they get it in the second uh, prime, uh, trimester, when you start treatment by the third trimester, the bile acid level goes down. Uh, that is mostly like a kind of a bit of a benign type. But some uh, certain types, uh, the, though we start the medication, the bile, it's very difficult con to control the bile acid level. It goes up continuous. So we try to get very high doses of medication. Failing that, then we have to consider the delivery of the baby regarding the safety of the baby at the correct time. Uh, so the benign one, there are this benign one is the uh, the kind of a mild type of uh, uh, intrahepatic cholesterol of the pregnancy, and usually they respond very well. Usually it it, they, it comes in the second trimester. Thank you very much. I think we move on to our second talk. The second talk is in uh, on hypertension in pregnancy. It will be delivered by Dr. Shamita Dasanayaka. Dr. Shamita Dasanayaka is a consultant physician in internal medicine attached to Colombo North Teaching Hospital, Ragama. Over to you, Shamita. Thank you, Dr. Achala, for that kind words of introduction. Uh, my task today is to uh, discuss about the hypertension in pregnancy. This is a very uh, last and vast area, and uh, I need to finish it off with 25 minutes. But uh, hypertension in pregnancy, there are four different entities that we are talking about. Uh, one is the chronic hypertension in pregnancy, and the gestational hypertension, uh, preeclampsia, and eclampsia. Uh, because of the different uh, audience that we are having today, I thought of going through the uh, definitions of this. And in pregnancy, uh, we are called the hypertension, is that the blood pressure of 140 in systolic or higher, or the 90 of diastolic or higher. This is called hypertension. And the definition of severe hypertension means the blood pressure over 160 systolic over 110 in diastolic. And chronic hypertension is hypertension that is present at the booking visit or before 20 weeks or if the woman is already taking antihypertensive medication when referred to maternal services. It can be primary or secondary in etiology. And gestational hypertension is new hypertension presenting after 20 weeks of gestation without significant proteinuria. And uh, this is very important to understand what is preeclampsia and the difference between the gestational hypertension. Preeclampsia is defined as new onset of hypertension 
that is over 140 millimeters Hg systole or 90 millimeters of diastole after 20 weeks of pregnancy and the coexistence of one or more of the following new onset conditions. The first one is, is proteinuria. If you are going by the protein creatinine ratio that is of more than 30 milligrams or more, or if you are going by the albumin creatinine ratio is 8 milligrams per millimoles or more, or at least 1 gram per liter that is 2 plus on dipstick testing. Combine with other maternal organ dysfunction. Uh, that is, uh, I'll tell you, it's uh, renal insufficiency that is creating in 90 micromoles per liter or more, or 1.02 milligrams per 100 ml or more. And the liver involvement is elevated transaminase uh, AST over 40, with or without right upper quadrant or epigastric abdominal pain. Neurological compli complications such as eclampsia, altered mental status, blindness, stroke, clonus, severe headache, or persistent visual scotoma. Hematological complications such as thrombocytopenia, that is plated count of below less than 150, DIC, the disseminated intravascular coagulation, or hemolysis. And the lastly, uteropresental dysfunction, such as fetal growth restriction, abnormal umbilical artery Doppler waveform analysis, or stillbirth. And eclampsia is a convulsive condition associated with preeclampsia. And the severe preeclampsia means is preeclampsia with severe hypertension that does not respond to the treatment or is associated with ongoing or recurring severe headache, visual scotoma, nausea, vomiting, epigastric pain, oliguria, and severe hypertension, as well as progressive deterioration in laboratory blood tests such as rising creatinine liver transaminases, falling plated count, or failure of fetal growth or abnormal Doppler findings. Right. So why we are discussing about these things is about the high blood pressure in pregnancy affects 1 in 10 women, those who are pregnant women, 1 in 10 is presenting with a pregnancy induced hypertension or related with the hypertension. And it lets 140 by 90 or more. And 20% of the pregnant mothers, they are having pre-existing chronic hypertension and 80% of them are gestational or pre-eclampsia. We'll go through the gestational hypertension and uh, two different entities of gestational hypertension. Hypertension means the blood pressure of 140 by 90 and less than 159 by 109. And severe hypertension means the pressure is 160 by 110 or more. An important thing is this gestational hypertension not usually accompanied by fetal growth restriction. Outcomes in pregnancy normally good, but approximately 25% will go on to develop PET symptoms, and particularly if less than 34 weeks, and have a poor outcomes. If you are going through the gestational hypertension and the risk factors for gestational hypertension is a nulliparity, age 40 years or older, pregnancy interval of more than 10 years, family history of preeclampsia, or multifetal pregnancy. Further, it's BMI of 35 uh, or more, gestational age at presentation, previous history of preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, pre-existing vascular disease or pre-existing kidney disease. These are the risk factors for gestational hypertension. And this is about the antiplatelet agents. It's important to know that advise pregnant women at high risk of preeclampsia, now the patient is having gestational hypertension, but she is having a high risk for preeclampsia, needs to take 75 to 150 milligrams of aspirin daily from 12 weeks until the birth of the baby. When at high risk are those with any of the following. That means hypertensive heart disease during a previous pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease such as SLE or antiphosphorus syndrome, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and chronic hypertension. 
And considering the other pharmaceutical agents, is they are advising, do not use the following to prevent hyperensive disorders during pregnancy. That is nitric oxide donors, progesterone, diuretics, or low, volume, or low molecular weight heparin. These are not indicated to prevent hyperensive disorders during pregnancy. And about the nutritional supplements, and they are not recommending the following supplements solely with the aim of preventing hyperensive disorders during pregnancy. That is magnesium, folic acid, antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E, fish oils or alga oils, and the garlic. Diet, and they are, do not recommend salt restriction during pregnancy solely to prevent gestational hypertension or preeclampsia. And the lifestyle, give the same advice on rest, exercise, and work to women with chronic hypertension or at risk of hypertensive disorders during pregnancy as healthy pregnant women. And we'll come to the gestational hypertension, the management. There are two, uh, two vast aspects. One is the watch and wait. The other one is treat. Watch and wait, that means if a pregnant mother with a gestational hypertension coming with a blood pressure of 140 by 90 and less than 160 by 110 can be managed, this can be managed as an outpatient with once or twice weekly blood pressure measurements. And we need urine deep stick, weekly bloods. This is placental growth factor testing. This is a new entity, I will uh, tell you more about this. And two to four weekly ultrasound for fetal assessment. Consider pharmacological treatment if blood pressure remains above 140 by 90. So if the patient, if the pregnant mother is having persistently high blood pressure of more than 140 by 90, then we need to start with the pharmacological treatment. And the recommendation is you start with the labetalol or nifedipine or the methyl dopa. The first they are recommending the labetalol and second the nifedipine, lastly the methyl dopa. But if the gestational hypertension mother is having severe hypertension, that means more than 160 by 110, that patient needs admission. And if the blood pressure coming down less than 140 by 90, then we have to manage as hypertension in uh, pregnancy. And this patient needs treatment then and there, you should not wait. And we need to record the blood pressure every 15 to 30 minutes until the target blood pressure of less than 130 by 85. So a pregnant mother with gestation hypertension presenting with severe hypertension needs immediate treatment and your target blood pressure is to bring down it's less than 135 85. And that patient needs to continue with the pharmacological treatment. And this patient is now in admitted and she needs daily urine diptic while inpatient and measurement of the full blood count, urine electrolytes, liver functions at presentation, and then weekly. Carry out this placental growth factor testing and the fetal assessment. There's one word about this placental growth factor testing. Now, uh, this is a new investigation coming to the guidelines, and this uh, latest guidelines by the NINES is strongly recommending to check this uh, placental growth factor in a view of differentiating chronic hypertension or gestational hypertension from preeclampsia. So uh, I invite all of you to read about this thing. This is a new entity and this is the one which strongly recommended uh, from the latest guidelines by the NICE. What about the delivery and the timing of birth in gestation hypertension? And do not offer planned early birth before 37 weeks of 37 weeks if the blood pressure is lower than 160 by 110, unless there are other medical indicators. So if the blood pressure is less than 160 by 110, you try to maintain the pregnancy up to 37 weeks, if there's no any other medical indications. If birth is necessary, offer steroids at magnesium sulfate in line with the guidelines on preterm labor and birth. And about the outcomes, the, I told you about two outcomes. One is the watch and wait if the pressure is 140 by 90 and the other one is treatment. 
So if you are delaying treatments or watch and wait, two in 10 pregnant mothers might go into the severe hypertension and 47% patient, uh, 47 of them and admissions to the NNU, neonatal units. And if you are treating one in 10 pregnant mothers going into severe hypertension and 23% admissions to the neonatal units. So we'll move into the preeclampsia. This is the most important one for this uh, presentation today is the preeclampsia. The important is preeclampsia is a complex medical disorder associated with over 500,000 fetal and neonatal deaths and over 70,000 maternal deaths globally each year. And preeclamptic pregnant mothers can deteriorate rapidly and without warning. Preeclampsia may develop or be recognized for the first time intrapartum or early postpartum in some cases. And this is important. Proteinuria is not mandatory for a diagnosis of preeclampsia. And the risk factors for the preeclampsia, there are two types of uh, risk factors. One is moderate, the other one is a high. The moderate risk factors are first pregnancy, age 40 years or older, pregnancy interval more than 10 years, BMI of more than 35, family history of preeclampsia, and multiparity. I told uh, before this also. And come to the high, high risk factors, are the hypertensive disease during a previous pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease such as uh, SLE or antifacipate, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and chronic hypertension. So uh, it is important, patient with type 1 or type 2 diabetes or chronic hypertension is considered as high risk for preeclampsia. And the preeclampsia, that is two or more moderate risk factors or one or more high risk factors, need to start with aspirin, that is 75 to 150 milligrams per day from 12 weeks until birth. And about the preeclampsia, the timing of birth, preeclampsia, the recorded maternal and fetal threshold for planned early birth before 37 weeks in women with preeclampsia. So we'll go through the thresholds. So what are the thresholds for early delivery of these pregnant mothers in preeclampsia? The thresholds for considering planning early birth could include, but are not limited to, any of the following known features of severe preeclampsia. One is inability to control maternal blood pressure despite using three or more classes of antihypertensives in appropriate doses. So if you can't control the blood pressure of pregnant mother by using three with their appropriate doses, then there's an indication for a delivery. And the maternal pulse oximetry, less than 90%. Progressive deterioration in liver function, renal function, hemolysis, or platelet count. Ongoing neurological features, such as severe intractable headache, repeated visual disturbances, or Placental abruption, reverse inflow diastolic flow, abnormal CTG, or stillbirth. So in these situations, offer intravenous magnesium sulfate and a course of antenatal corticosteroids if indicated. If early birth is planned for women with preterm preeclampsia in line with the guideline of preterm labor and birth. And this is also after delivery, your target blood pressure is to keep less than 135 by 85 or bring down to 135 by 85. And the post delivery, the post delivery of the preeclamptic mothers, preeclampsia should be considered at high risk for preeclamptic complications for at least three days and should have their clinical conditions monitored at least every four hours while awake. So preeclamptic mother, after the delivery also, you need to check the blood pressure when the mother is awake at least minimum of period of four hours. And it is important to note that eclamptic seizures may develop for the first time in the early postpartum period. So even though the patient has delivered, the patient might develop preeclamptic uh, fits 
uh, after delivery in the early postpartum period. And it's also important to say that avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs for postpartum analgesia in preeclampsia or the, if the patient is having AKI. For your interest, I will just tell you uh, about the predictor models. There are about three predictor models uh, in the guidelines as well as in the, uh, if you can go through the internet. Uh, I'm not going to detail of this. These are some scoring systems. You can use the full pillars, full peers, and the prep PES and PLGF, that means placental growth factor. Uh, these uh, prediction models you can use with various parameters. You can do it as online as well. And there are some calculators. If you go in through the uh, online, you can download the calculators as well to predict the outcome of the preeclampsia. We'll come to the uh, severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. Eclampsia means, as I told you, uh, like this is the fitting that's developing the convulsions in uh, preeclamptic mother is called eclampsia and about the anticonvulsant and these patients should be managed ideally in a critical care setting or in an ICU setting. If a woman in critical care setting who has severe hypertension or severe preeclampsia has or previously had an eclamptic fit give intravenous magnesium sulfate. So we need to give the uh, magnesium sulfate. And the other indication is to give magnesium sulfate is that women with severe preeclampsia who are in a critical care setting if birth is planned within 24 hours because magnesium sulfate is considered as a neuroprotective of the baby as well. So if you are planning for a delivery for next 24 hours then that patient is also indicated for treat with the magnesium sulfate. Consider the uh, need for magnesium sulfate treatment if one or more of the following features of severe preeclampsia is present. One is, this one or more need, ongoing or recurring severe headaches, visual scotoma, nausea or vomiting, epigastric pain, oliguria and severe hypertension, and progressive deterioration in laboratory blood tests, that is such as rising creatinine or rising liver enzymes, or falling platelet count. So those are the indications to give magnesium sulfate uh, in severe preeclampsia eclamptic patient. About the treatment of magnesium sulfate, a loading dose of 4 grams should be given intravenously over 5 to 15 minutes followed by an infusion of 1 gram per hour maintained for 24 hours. That is the usual treatment method that we are using. But if the, women, if the woman has had an ecleptic fit, the infusion should be continued for 24 hours after the last fit. So after the last fit, we need to continue magnesium sulfate for a period of 24 hours. And if the mother is having recurrent fits, should be treated with further dose of 2 to 4 grams intravenously over 5 to 15 minutes. So while the patient is having a continuous infusion, if the patient is developing uh, epileptic fit or the uh, convulsion, then we need to treat with the intravenous boluses with the magnesium sulfate. And for your information, it is important that do not use diazepam, phenytoin or other anti as an alternative to magnesium sulfate in women with eclampsia. So these are the latest guidelines uh, from the NICE laid down in 17th of April last this year, 2023. And what are the antihypertensives that we should use in uh, eclampsia is treat women with severe hypertension who are in critical care during pregnancy or after birth immediately with one of the following. So the first recommendation is labetalol. We can give labetalol with oral or intravenous. And the second one is oral nifedipine. And the third one is intravenous hydrolysine. So there are, there are some, uh, there are some uh, comparisons between the labetalol and the intravenous hydrolysine and uh, usually they are considered that the labetalol we 
give a smooth control of the blood pressure compared to the hydrolysine. About the fluid balance and volume expansion in uh, eclamptic or preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia, do not use volume expansion in women with severe preeclampsia unless hydrolysine is the anti, uh, antenatal hypertensive that we have used. So you, we should not use volume expansion in women with severe preeclampsia. In women with severe preeclampsia, limit maintenance fluid to 80 ml per hour unless there are other ongoing fluid losses, for example, like hemorrhage. So we need to stick to eight, 80 milliliters per hour unless there are no other uh, fluid losses. I don't want to go in detail with the HELP syndrome because uh, Dr. Priyankar has done uh, very nicely uh, the, with all these aspects. But important one is the HELP syndrome is the hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. And do not use dexamethasone or betamethasone for the treatment of HELP syndrome. Right? As a treatment of HELP syndrome, you should not use uh, dexamethasone. But if, you th if the, the VOG or the physician thinks that well, as a lung maturity, of the baby, then you can go ahead and give the dexamethasone, but it's not a, the dexamethasone or the betamethasone is not for the treatment of HELP syndrome. Then we'll come to the uh, postnatal period and the breastfeeding period. Advice women with hypertension who wish to breastfeed that their treatment can be adapted to accommodate breastfeeding. So the mothers can continue with the breastfeeding and that the need to make antihypertensive medication does not prevent them from breastfeeding. Offer enerapil to treat hypertension in women during the postnatal period. So the first recommendation is enerapil with appropriate monitoring of maternal renal function and maternal serum potassium. For women with black African or Caribbean family, with hypertension during the postnatal period, consider antihypertensive treatment with nifedipine or amlodipine if the woman has previously used this to successfully control her blood pressure. For women with hypertension in the postnatal period, if the blood pressure is not controlled within a single medicine, consider a combination of nifedipine or amlodipine and enerapil. So you can combine enerapil and the amlodipine or the nifedipine. And if this combination is not tolerated or is ineffective, consider either adding atenolol or labetalol to the combination of treatment. Or you can swap it. One of the medicines already been used for atenolol or labetalol. Right? Either you can combine with enerapil with labetalol or you can combine enerapil with atenolol or you can use the nifedipine and the atenolol labetalol. And the postnatal period uh, where possible is avoid using diuretics or angiotensin receptor blockers. So these guidelines specifically say that where possible Avoid using diuretics or angiotensin receptor blockers to treat hypertension in women in the postnatal period who are breastfeeding or expressing milk. There are recent, a uh, lot of people having a curiosity about if we can give enerapil, why we can't give uh, losartan for these uh, breastfeeding mothers. And uh, there are various other things because the, you should inform the breastfeeding mothers that these uh, chemicals, but whatever the antihypertensive that we are using, can go into the babies with the breast milk and uh, some of these ingredients may act on baby and the pressure might come down and uh, so the looking at the baby and the neonatologist needs to inform that this uh, pregnant mother is taking the antihypertensives. And uh, for the last one mi five minutes, I would like to consider uh, about the chronic hypertension Yes, this is very important for all of us. So if a pregnant lady who is having hypertension, having fertility wishes, needs to assess thoroughly. Because most of these uh, pregnant la they are young ladies with a pregnancy uh, fertility wishes, they are young, and this hypertension may be secondary. So it is very important to go through 
uh, whether these uh, these patients having a secondary cause for hypertension and we should address that ideally we should address that before the pregnancy and the other important factor is if a lady on uh, long term hypertensive medications then we need to change that before pregnancy say that if that uh, patient is taking either losartan or uh, some other medication then we need to change it to either nifedipine or like something like labetalol or whatever and it's important to screen for the other aspect as well and give the correct uh, lifestyle modifications correct advices and all these are important when you are addressing the uh, patient with chronic hypertension and we have to optimize these uh, patients before embarking on pregnancy and that is will minimize the threat to the mother and the baby uh, because of the uh, problems in hypertension so uh, this references is from the, this is a nice guideline uh, there has a lot of changes in the latest guidelines that is on 17th of april 2023 and this is the one which uh, strongly recommend of the plus uh, placental growth factor in the management of uh, hypertension in pregnancy and uh, this national guidelines and so on and i would like to thank the uh, college of internal medicine for inviting for this lecture and also the sri lanka medical association uh, giving this opportunity to this uh, lecture today Thank you. Thank you, Shamita, for your uh, extensive elaboration on hypertension in pregnancy. Now the session is open for discussion. You can type in your questions in the chat box. I can direct it to the speaker. Yeah. Yes, it's depending on whether we are giving uh, for the preeclampsia or eclampsia, right? Uh, if we are giving preeclampsia without any seizures, then we give the loading dose and we need to continue uh, one gram per day for 24 hours. While we are continuing this infusion, if the mother has developed a seizure, then at that point we can give the loading doses, but we need to continue that one gram per day uh, hour, one gram per hour infusion for 24 hours from the last fit. So that is the recommendation. So because uh, sometimes uh, people are having that already the patient is on magnesium uh, sulfate infusion while on uh, infusion if the patient is developing a fit whether we can give a loading dose or not. So they are recommending each and every time if the patient is developing uh, seizures while the patient is on infusion we have to give a bolus. Uh, because and because the most important one is they are not recommending any other uh, anti-epileptic medication for epileptic fits. So that is the important thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's very important, and uh, that's why the uh, mo most of the and uh, not most, it's uh, each and every patient with the eclampsia or the severe preeclampsia should manage in the ICU setting. Right, because these patients can have some, uh, sometimes the, pres the pressure might crash, sometimes the uh, seizures, sometimes the reflexes will go down and uh, neurological manifestation will come. And so this patient needs to connect to a monitor with the ECG rhythm strips and all this uh, monitoring should be there, uh, including the saturation and so on. So sometimes if, uh, if the urine output again, sometimes when you are the, if the patient is on infusion, the urine output might come down. So during these situations, we have to manage, and uh, they are specifically saying not to give fluids, right? We are, want to continue with ATML power, unless there are uh, no online uh, losses to give. So it's important sometimes we can stop this one or two hours uh, if the patient is stable uh, until the, the output is recovering. The monitoring is important while the patient is, and that's why it's not recommended to give uh, magnesium sulfate infusions in the ward, in the ward setting. So it's, it's very important we should not manage uh, eclamptic or pre-eclamptic patient in a ward setting. It should be ideal in a HD or ICU setting. Uh, thank you, Shamita. There is another question. It's about a scenario. Uh, there are some, uh, the, one of the 
people asking 36 years 36 weeks pregnant patient coming with a blood pressure of 170 by 110 hmm. with brisk reflexes and urine protein 3 pluses what should we give first maxal for any antihypertensive agent that's the question yeah so uh, now it's now this is the blood pressure is more than 160 by 110 so uh, this is should be going hand in hand so the this patient ideally patient needs iv labitalol to control the blood pressure to bring down and we need to have the collaboration over there having a discussion with the multidisciplinary team with the vog and if this patient needs delivery within next 24 hours so in that situation we need to give magnesium sulfate as well right because for the one is is protecting for as the uh, eclamptic and prevent the preeclampsia going into the eclampsia and also neuroprotection of the baby. So in the, uh, the uh, now this is in the severe hypertension, the patient needs treatment for uh, hypertension and try to bring down the blood pressure to 135, 85 level, while uh, we need to consider and give the magnesium sulfate as well. Uh, then again, they're asking like, how many magnesium sulfate boluses can be given? That's why I told, right? So the first bolus, the, if the patient doesn't have epileptic fit, the first one is the bolus. We can give four grams bolus, then you need to continue one gram per hour for 24 hours. But if the patient develops a seizure in between, then you can repeat a bolus. Each and every time that patient is going to have this uh, epileptic seizures, you can give. But from the last fit, we need to continue up to 24 hours. Okay, thank you. In the absence of further questions, uh, thank you once again for your excellent lecture. Now, thank the you. second, third topic is hyperglycemia in pregnancy. The speaker is Dr. Indika Boteju, consultant resident physician attached to Castle Street Hospital to women in Colombo. Uh, over to you, Dr. Indika. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair President, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Okay, uh, at the outset, uh, let me thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for organizing this event and for the invitation. Um, hyperglycemia in pregnancy is uh, not uncommon, and uh, as you all are aware, pregnancy is associated with hyperglycemia, and pregnancy is a, a diabetogenic and ketogenic state. Uh, because uh, during pregnancy, the placental hormones, they cause insulin resistance, and at the same time, there will be partial pancreatic beta cell failure, uh, and they might not meet the demands of uh, carbohydrate metabolism uh, demands in pregnancy. And uh, there's another mechanism going on. The mother's glucose will be uh, transported to the uh, fetal uh, placental circulation uh, as an independent mechanism, uh, independent to insulin. Uh, uh, in insulin uh, mechanism. So this, the, the, because of that, usually in pregnancy, the blood sugar levels, which is uh, in a normal woman, uh, we take uh, as the ADA criteria. But in uh, pregnancy, the normal blood sugar levels is pretty much lower than we expect. The normal blood sugar level in pregnancy is lower than the normal non-pregnant women's blood sugar. And diabetes uh, causes significant maternal and fetal complications. Uh, they can have a fetal macrosomia, uh, fetal malformations, polyhydramnios, uh, so, for, so on and so forth. And uh, they can have uh, even intrauterine deaths because of hyperglycemia. So this hyperglycemic pregnancy controlling is very important when it comes to pregnancy. And uh, pre-existent diabetes is a risk factor for preeclampsia as we discussed earlier. So we have to be careful uh, when monitoring their, these patients' blood pressure, and we need to act uh, they are very fast if the patient is uh, developing hypertension, especially preeclampsia. And uh, there's a risk of developing obesity and uh, hypertension and type 2 diabetes in the newborn if the newborn was exposed to hyperglycemia during uh, his or her fetal life. And the prevalence of diabetes in pregnancy has been increasing with the worldwide uh, increasing of the prevalence of obesity and prediabetes. 
Uh, this is Sri Lankan data, which shows that uh, pre-existing diabetes, uh, prevalence of pre-existing diabetes is around 3.8 uh, in 2017, and the GDM, uh, prevalence of GDM is around uh, 5% uh, in 2017, which has gone up to 4.8 and to 7.8 respectively in 2022, uh, 2021. Uh, so, in all altogether, there had been about uh, prevalence of 12% hyperglycemia in pregnancy uh, patients uh, uh, in year 2021. Uh, that comes up to about uh, 33,000 of mothers with hyperglycemia in pregnancy uh, in that uh, in, a, in a given period uh, in the island wide. And uh, when it comes to classification of hyperglycemia in pregnancy, we know that the uh, patients who are having uh, pre-existing diabetes can develop, uh, can go into pregnancy. So those patients uh, from the first trimester, we know that they are diabetics uh, and they have hyperglycemia in pregnancy. And there are another category of patients uh, who are unknown to have uh, pre-existing diabetes, type 1 or type 2, but they get pregnant and while uh, they are, while in uh, their first trimester, we diagnose them to have diabetes. And there's uh, another group, uh, pre-diabetes, uh, who are getting pregnant, again, coming with pregnancy. And uh, the gestational diabetes, uh, by the definition itself, is uh, the blood sugar uh, rise onset is for after first week of uh, first uh, trimester of pregnancy, uh, after 12 weeks of POA. And it's a transient condition which results after delivery of the baby. And uh, the, these patients, when they come for uh, pregnant patients, when they come for the booking visit, they will come with fasting blood sugar, uh, postprandial blood sugar, and HbA1c level. And uh, as I said earlier, they are, these patients' uh, blood sugar levels uh, are pretty much lower uh, uh, in their first trimester because they have nausea, vomiting, and as well as uh, there's a, a glucose taken up by the fetus, maternal, maternal uh, fetal uh, circulation, circulation. So because of that, uh, their fasting blood sugar normal level, we take it as 95, and the postprandial blood sugar after two hours, we take it as 120. Uh, and the HbA1c, we take it as less than 6%. So if those are not there, then we will go on to check the OGTT. OGTT usually we do at 12 weeks of period of gestation. Uh, that is uh, being uh, South Asian. We have high risk for uh, gestational diabetes because of that. It is recommended to screen these mothers with OGTT at 12 weeks of POA. And uh, if that is also negative, then it is uh, recommended to the next OGTT at uh, 24 to 20 weeks of uh, gestation. However, if the patient is having obesity or family history of diabetes uh, or uh, pre-diabetes, uh, then uh, there's a risk of getting gestational diabetes before 24 to 28 weeks, but after 12 weeks of POA. Because of that, it is uh, reasonable and recommended to do uh, uh, additional OGTT around 18 weeks of period of gestation. Now we know uh, uh, the cutoff levels for pre-diabetes and diabetes in normal adult female. However, in hyperglycemia in pregnancy, the cutoffs are pretty much different and it's lower uh, than we think. Uh, so if the patient is having a HbA1c of more than 6% in her first trimester, we take it as hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Now, the, the HbA1c usually we do not use uh, regularly uh, for follow-up of these patients uh, because of two reasons. One is uh, there's a, a high turnover of red blood cells during pregnancy, and as well as there's uh, dilutional anemia uh, in pregnancy. So because of that, HbA1c will not give a accurate value after first trimester. And if the patient's fasting blood sugar is, if it is more than 95 milligrams per deciliter, uh, and if the uh, PPBS values, uh, PPBS one hour value, if it is more than 140, or the second hour value more than 120, we take it as hyperglycemia in pregnancy. 
if if a patient is not uh, diagnosed as uh, diabetes previously, then uh, as I told, we can do OGTT uh, at 12 weeks of POA or 24 to 28 weeks of POA. So at uh, uh, 12 weeks or 24 weeks of POA, if we do the OGTT, we uh, look for three values. Uh, one is fasting blood sugar, which has to be less than 95, 95 milligrams per deciliter. And the second hour value, we expect to have uh, less than 180. And the second hour value, we expect to have less than 140 milligrams per deciliter. So if uh, out of these three values, if one value is abnormal, we diagnose as gestational diabetes mellitus in pregnancy. So uh, preconception care is very important before they become pregnant. We have to make sure for pre-existing pre diabetic mothers uh, that their blood sugar control is optimally controlled. And uh, we should emphasize the importance of achieving normal glycemia for these patients. We should maintain a, at least the HbA1c less than 6.5%. That is the target. And we need to educate them on nutrition, diabetes care, exercise, and uh, other complications which could occur. And we need to address those complications where are necessary. And we need to screen those diabetic uh, uh, comorbidities and complications and do the necessary referrals. And uh, it is very, very important to review the medications which these patients are on uh, in, in the preconception period. Uh, because uh, if they are on AC inhibitors, AR angiotensin receptor blockers, and statins, they are teratogenic. So because of that, we need to uh, change their uh, uh, prescriptions uh, if necessary. And uh, we need to refer them for IE examination once they get pregnant especially, because pregnancy is a major risk factor for the progression of diabetic eye disease. And uh, family planning should be discussed, and uh, we should arrange uh, if the patient's blood sugar is not controlled to optimum level before pregnancy. Uh, once the patient is pregnant, it becomes a, a teamwork, a multidisciplinary care. Uh, first, uh, we need to arrange a nutritional plan for her with the referral to a nutrition team and uh, the optimum calorie intake has to be decided depending on the body mass index of the patient. May patient can be underweight, maybe normal weight, maybe having overweight or obesity. So the uh, daily calorie intake has to be decided upon uh, based on the BMI value of the patient. Uh, and the frequent and smaller uh, small frequent meals evenly spaced out throughout the day is recommended and it should be encouraged. And uh, we should avoid prolonged fasting for these patients because uh, it can cause uh, fetal hypoglycemia. Uh, even for fasting blood sugar, about eight hour fasting is more than enough uh, for the uh, follow up and for the blood sugar series measurements also. And the diet should have uh, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats and uh, should limit uh, saturated fats and uh, tra artificial and uh, trans fats. Uh, as you are aware, exercise has shown uh, benefit uh, even in pregnancy to control uh, hyperglycemia. And it has shown that uh, walking, uh, station cycling, uh, aerobic exercises all give uh, benefits uh, during pregnancy even. Uh, and it will delay the start of uh, pharmacological therapy also in these patients uh, with hyperglycemia, especially in uh, gestational diabetes. However, we need to discuss uh, the, the necessity and the, what we are going to do with the VOG team uh, because sometimes there may be uh, some contraindications like low lying placentas or uh, uh, bleeding problems during pregnancy. Um, then about uh, pharmacological therapy, the insulin is the preferred pharmacological medication at the moment uh, 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 prescribed by the international gui guidelines uh, as the first line treatment for these patients. Uh, earlier we were uh, using metformin, but uh, now the new current guidelines and the current evidence suggest that insulin is better than metformin. Because of that, international guidelines all suggest to start insulin for the patient if we fail on uh, uh, non-pharmacological measures to control blood sugar. However, 
we, we know that the metformin does cross the placenta, but the insulin, uh, most of the human insulin, does not cross the placenta to a significant level. And insulin should be used for management of type 1 diabetes, obviously. And the insulin pumps also used uh, during pregnancy in other countries. It is not contraindicated and is recommended also. Um, in early pregnancy, insulin requirement can be low because in early pregnancy there is uh, loss of appetite and uh, vomiting to, a, to some degree. So because of that, as well as there will be uh, less amount of uh, secretion of placental hormone, so the insulin resistance will be a little bit low compared to the second and third trimester. Because of that, in early pregnancy, your insulin requirement may, can be low. However, from around 16 weeks, insulin, uh, insulin requirement might go up because insulin resistance begins to uh, increase uh, with the placental hormone secretion. And uh, total daily insulin requirement can be increased by about 5% per week up to 16 weeks. Uh, with the placental aging, uh, that is after about 36 weeks at the end of the third trimester, uh, there, uh, uh, there can be uh, reduction, uh, there can be level of, of insulin requirement. Uh, then there you, can, you might see there's uh, sometimes uh, uh, reduction of insulin requirement for these patients in the third trimester at the uh, 36 to 40 weeks. However, if this happens in uh, around 28 weeks, say 32 weeks, that means there can be due to, uh, that can be due to placental insufficiency because placenta has got prematurely uh, insufficient. In that situation, uh, please note that uh, it has to be informed to the VOG team because there can be ongoing intrauterine uh, uh, growth retardation. So antenatally, uh, insulin therapy, uh, st uh, starting insulin therapy has two regimes, that is uh, basal bolus regime and the premix insulin. Uh, actually, basal bolus regime is the recommended uh, regime to be used in pregnancy, where you can use uh, pre-meal short-acting insulin uh, three times per day before each me main meal. And then uh, to cover up the fasting hyperglycemia, we can use basal insulin at night before going to bed. In government sector, we have human insulin, uh, soluble insulin and isopane insulin, which is intermediate insulin. So we use uh, uh, isopane insulin uh, at 10, and we use soluble insulin uh, before uh, each meal uh, to counteract the post-meal hyperglycemia. However, if a patient with type 2 diabetes or uh, type 1 diabetes, the patient is on pre-mixed insulin, and the blood sugar is well controlled with that, then of course, uh, if the patient is not willing to go to basal bolus regime where we have to give three boluses of injections. Uh, then uh, we can continue with premix insulin uh, with uh, close monitoring. Uh, please be uh, mindful that uh, the po post-lunch blood sugar might go up with this premix insulin dosage. So because of that, sometimes we might need to give uh, pre-lunch uh, soluble insulin in addition to the premix insulin. So out of uh, insulins which we have, in the government sector we have uh, human insulin and in private sector we have analog insulin as well. So both are uh, recommended uh, depending on uh, their, uh, their uh, generics. And uh, uh, human ins out of human insulin, uh, uh, soluble insulin, regular insulin and the uh, isopane insulin is recommended. Uh, NPH is recommended. Uh, out of analog insulin, uh, insulin uh, Lispro and insulin uh, Aspart is recommended as rapid acting insulin and uh, uh, insulin Ditamia as uh, long acting insulin. However, uh, insulin uh, glulosine, uh, insulin glargine, uh, insulin deglutec and inhaled insulin is not yet recommended to use during pregnancy. Then uh, about uh, metformin, so the, which metformin is very uh, user-friendly uh, to the patient as well as to the practitioner. However, uh, now the current trend is to change it to insulin rather than uh, using metformin. Uh, we know that uh, metformin is the only oral uh, hypoglycemic uh, medication uh, can, which can be used during pregnancy. All the other uh, hypoglycemic drugs 
oral hypoglycemic drugs are contraindicated during pregnancy and lactation. Uh, because of that, if we can't control the patient's blood sugar with metformin alone, then of course we will have to start on insulin. Um, we, according to the local guidelines, still we can start metformin or insulin depending on the patient's choice. Uh, though the international guidelines, the newer guidelines suggest to start insulin as the first line. And uh, if, uh, if the patient was on metformin uh, for uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, the guidelines suggest to stop that after first week of, uh, first uh, uh, 12 weeks of pregnancy in the first trimester and change to uh, insulin instead. And uh, the, the bad thing about metformin is metformin can cause growth restriction, acidosis uh, in the presence of placental insufficiency, hypertension, or preeclampsia. So if those uh, conditions are there, then uh, we better uh, change metformin into uh, change and uh, stop metformin and go and start insulin. Uh, the good thing about metformin is, uh, is it is associated with uh, lower risk of neonatal hypo glycemia and less maternal weight gain than insulin. So the glycemic targets, uh, when we manage these patients, we have uh, different targets uh, in hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Uh, Self-monitoring of blood glucose is uh, recommended uh, in Castle Street Hospital. We actually uh, give uh, blood glucose monitoring machines for the patients. Uh, where they can monitor their own blood glucose, if, especially if the patient is on insulin. And uh, blood sugar control targets are uh, obviously different compared to non-pregnant women. And uh, we monitor these patients uh, using blood sugar series. So blood sugar series involved uh, uh, fasting blood sugar as well as uh, postprandial uh, breakfast, uh, after the breakfast and after lunch uh, and after dinner. Uh, so, according to ACOG and RCOG uh, guidelines, uh, fasting blood sugar target is less than 95 milligrams per deciliter, and the one hour PPBS is less than 140, and the second hour PPBS is less than 120, and the HbA1c is less than 6%. However, newer ADA 2022 guidelines uh, has given a new target range rather than a point. Uh, so th we have to maintain the fasting blood sugar between 70 to 95 and the one hour PPBS 110 to 140 and the second hour PPBS 200 to 120 and the HbA1c less than 6%. Uh, this is especially if the patient is on insulin and uh, to prevent uh, fetal hypoglycemia without going, uh, without having uh, hypoglycemic e uh, episodes in the mother. So if we are happen to start insulin or metformin, uh, first we will see the fasting blood sugar values and the uh, OGTT values. And the fasting blood sugar is, if it is more than 126, and the OGTT values, uh, if one hour is more than 200 and second hour more than 180, it is unlikely that we could manage these patients with insulin alone, with uh, metformin and pharmacological therapy alone. So because of that, insulin should be started uh, as the first line. And if the passing blood sugar is, is uh, around 100 to 125, and OGTT second value is around 104 to 179, then of course we can either decide to start on insulin or metformin with the uh, medical nutrition treatment. However, if the blood sugar is uh, bit in between 95 to 99, and if the 75 uh, OGTT two hour value is 120 to 139, then of course uh, we may be able to manage these patients with uh, non-pharmacological uh, methods, including MNT alone. Right, now the postpartum care is very important for these patients uh, because uh, uh, when we consider about the patients, uh, 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 the progression into type two diabetes and we have to find the type two diabetes, whether it is continuing uh, after the GDM or whether the patient is developing pre-diabetes. Uh, usually in GDM, medication can be reduced or stopped just after delivery with monitoring, with close monitoring. And if the uh, women with GDM need screening uh, for type two diabetes, uh, we need to get them back to the uh, clinic every one, or one to three years and do the HbA1c and fasting blood sugar. 
and it is recommended to do uh, 75 gram OGTT at uh, 4 to 12 weeks uh, postpartum uh, if the patient has had GDM. And uh, preconception counseling require, required for G mothers with GDM who has history of GDM uh, for the next pregnancy uh, because sometimes they don't know that they have type 2 diabetes when they come to the next pregnancy, but they have a history of GDM in the past. Uh, lactation actually uh, it should be encouraged to breastfeeding mothers uh, and uh, breastfeeding, as you know, have metabolic benefits both to mother and to the baby. And uh, lactation can increase the risk of overnight uh, hypoglycemia, so because of that, uh, we have to uh, inform the hypoglycemic symptoms to the patient as well as uh, we have to monitor carefully and if necessary we have to reduce the medication and uh, do not start oral hypoglycemics uh, except metformin during breastfeeding because all the other uh, oral hypoglycemics can secrete uh, to the breast milk uh, and uh, cause uh, uh, neonatal hypoglycemia and uh, do not continue uh, doing uh, blood sugar series on these patients after delivery because after delivery the mother is like a normal uh, female with uh, type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes or uh, pre-diabetes and uh, contraception is also very important in these patients following delivery and uh, to avoid uh, unplanned pregnancies, especially if a patient is type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes uh, getting an unplanned pregnancy, obviously that patient's blood sugar may be uh, not optimally controlled at that time. And we have to arrange a regular contraception review for those patients with uh, pre-existing diabetes. And um, uh, contraception options and the recommendations are similar to women with pregnancy as well as in non-pregnancy, so there's no difference. Uh, on uh, deciding contraception for these patients. And uh, long-term reversible contraception methods are recommended. And uh, be please note that the risk of having complications from an unplanned pregnancy is higher than the risk from uh, any given uh, contraception. Because of that, we need to promote contraception uh, to have uh, uh, conception at the, at the right time for these patients. So that will bring us to the end of the talk. So I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Indika, for covering that uh, extensive topic, which is a very important entity we on encounter almost on a daily basis. Uh, we can accommodate one or two quick, quick, quick questions. the pre-dinner blood sugar is high, do you recommend the isophen in the morning as well, other than the night dose? Uh, usually we give isophen at 10 p.m. to counteract the uh, fasting hyperglycemia, that is the following day, the if the fasting blood sugar is high, we give a dose of uh, increasing or uh, we change the dose at night uh, in the previous day. So for the dinner, we give uh, soluble insulin. Uh, that is uh, before their dinner. Pregnancy, we don't give any morning uh, isophen or intermediate acting insulin. We no, give only in the night time. Yes, we, we yeah. give at as night time. Basic. But there are uh, some occasions we, we give as a BD dose also. Uh, but it is not that common. Uh, usually, we are we can manage with uh, nighttime isopane insulin and uh, daytime pre meal soluble insulin. Okay, thank you. So, in the absence of further questions, I think we can conclude this session. Before we conclude, let me thank on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I wish to thank all three speakers for their excellent contributions to this maternal medicine uh, forum. And um, uh, also I would like to thank Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for providing, for collaborating with us. And uh, in appreciation of your contribution to today's uh,
monthly clinical meeting, let me offer uh, appreciation letters which are done by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I wish to call upon Dr. Priyankara Jayavadana, Dr. Shamita Dasanayaka, and Dr. Indika Boteju respectively, respectively to receive the letters of appreciation. Thank you.